We're Flock, and what we do is we use real-time data in order to ensure drones at a particular place and time. And I'm going to run you guys through a little bit more of what that means, and then run through a sort of case study on our findings using JavaScript for this sort of system. What we've done that's interesting, what we would do differently, how it's worked out pretty much. A flying robot JavaScript case study. So me, I lead the engineering team. I've been in eBay and other stuff. Drones, right? So they're being used in industry in an increasingly large amount of applications, right? So you've got surveying, construction, inspections, farming. You've got cinematography, videography. And we are finding an increasing amount of weird and seemingly boutique applications on an almost daily basis as we run this, build, as we run this business. So there's a problem, right? It is currently very, very difficult, if not impossible, to identify and quantify flight risks in anything resembling real time. So those might be air hazards, weather patterns, what's in the air with you, other drones, aircraft, helicopters, whatever, birds, I guess, uh, ground hazards, so buildings, cars, trains, power lines, and people, so you guys. And this isn't just idle speculation, right? Like, there's news, item all, news items all the time. Just a couple months ago, a drone disintegrated in midair in Japan, hit a bunch of kindergartners. Nobody was seriously injured, but this is a real problem, although my personal favorite has to be this. Because, first of all, that's straight up some video game shit. Like, that's the kind of headline you'd see on a newsreel in, like, Command and Conquer. And also, that is a $3 million missile hitting a $500 drone costing the insurance company $3 million and 500 pounds. So, you know. Anyway, um, so we build an app. We build a mobile application. Um, in effect, we collect the location and time from our customers. We ask them where and when they want to fly. We plot a radius around that location, display a bunch of risk information, so red for danger, and in real time, come back with a risk number and a price based on that. You move the map, you get a different price. No real magic. Well, lots of magic, but a simple-ish product, we think. We do so by ingesting a bunch of data to describe those three risk profiles we talked about earlier. So airspace, ground, ground risks, and people. So that's operator profiles. How many flights have you flown? How many crashes have you had? Drone details. How big is it? How much does it weigh? How fast can it go? How high can it fly? Is it covered in anthrax? I don't know, right? And environmental data. So what are the buildings around there? Cars, traffic conditions, population densities, and obviously weather. So visibility, rain, wind, other. We pipe all that delicious, delicious data through our proprietary secret sauce, which I'm not actually going to talk about in this talk on account of it being proprietary secret sauce. Um, and we produce numbers. We tell you how dangerous that is. It's a risk metric, 0 to 100 when we correlate that to a price. Magic. So we use them, right. So now we've got that out of the way. For a bit of context, let's talk about how we built the system. So we use a variety of tools across all of our stack. Our front end is a React Native application. Uh, we do do little bits of Swift and Kotlin just because sometimes React Native kind of sucks and you need actual device functionality or bindings to APIs you don't have or other stuff, but mostly it's a React Native app. On the back end, we run a microservice architecture, primarily Node.js servers, and we are running a ReasonML service in production, which, nah, ask me later. And we have a variety of third-party data sources, so Ordnance Survey, Google Places, Weather Underground, AirMap. All our primary source of truth is PostgreSQL, and we use RabbitMQ for messaging in the app. Great, lots, lots of pretty pictures, lots of boxes. Now, there are obviously problems here, right? So the system we've built comes with a variety of fairly particular constraints. Um, one of them is that we are reliant on a lot of third-party data. And third-party data sources are inherently flaky. They just fail some of the time for more or less no reason, or reasons that we don't know and have no control over. Right? If Google Places is down, we're down. They cannot be cached, or at least cannot be cached meaningfully or for any length of time, because that would violate their, ter their terms and conditions. 
and it changes more or less in real time, right? Like you make a request for weather now, you get one thing, you make a request for the same time in three days, the chances are you'll get a different set of weather parameters. So we can't really pre-request things either, which, you know, is not funny. So let's talk about those one at a time. So they're inherently flaky, right? Luckily, there is a wonderful tool called RxJS, which has helped us tremendously to address this particular problem, because the thing to realize about their flakiness is that for the most part, Google, pl Google Plays or AirMap or Weather Underground aren't down for very long. They'll blip on you in general, but they'll come back with data if you try again. So we went through a number of iterations. We built weird promise chains where we like recursively called the same promise, and it was a whole thing. But ultimately, this is a simplified version of the code that we use in order to retry our third-party so, so, yeah, data sources. Now, we do other stuff. We do actually cache requests for little bits of time. We have fallback data sources, but the TLDR here is we, step, we add a timeout on all of our requests. We map across them. We check which ones have failed, and we retry them up to, up to three times, typically. And I know we pass in a, num a number of retries, but shh, it's three. And yeah, we, we increase the back off, right? There's not that much magic actually here. You could definitely write all of this without our XJS. The thing that really sticks out to me is how concise this code is and how much we got done in, what is that, 15 lines of code, 16 lines of code? Whereas the promise implementation was, I don't remember, but it was in the hundreds. So, you know, our XJS. If you haven't tried it out, it is slick. You really should play with it. Um, Third-party data, uh, third data sources are return arbitrary complex data types. So these full set of things that Google returns for an arbitrary building at a location is an object which has 100-something keys. Now, we don't use all of those keys, but we certainly need to know what they are. In order, so why do we need to know the, what they are? Now, our algorithms change over time, right? Um, just because we're not using a building's I don't know, height today, does not necessarily mean that our algorithms won't evolve to use in the future. Which means that an engineer, instead of going to the data source and just knowing, oh, I have this cool thing that I can use to pr improve the calculation, ends up going on an epic quest to discover what it is we're pulling in. Now, there's a number of solutions to this problem, obviously. We could have just added documentation, just straight up in a text file. The problem is that that isn't enforced at any kind of code level doesn't really provide anything in the manner of, let's go with verification. So how do we document it? Well, we use flow. Specifically, we annotate everything that we ingest as a third-party data set with a flow type and other things as well, obviously, but it's particularly useful in this context as third-party data so that when a engineer is seeing what it is that we have on, say, the weather API, they straight up just open the flow type and they look, and if they try and use something they think is there that isn't, it will fail, which is nice. So there we go. We are masters of the universe. Computers do our bidding. We are Neo. Unfortunately, they changed third-party data sources, changed the underlying contract without warning. Sometimes the changes are benign. They might add a key. Sometimes they're less benign. Uh, Google Places, notably, quite recently, changed the format for the uh, reverse geocode on a place from an, array, from, a, from an array of object to an object with keys that then are arrays, which, as you can imagine, completely broke just all of our system. No warning, no notice, not even, not, not even an email, not even the, oh, we've just done this, just gone. This was me when that happened. So, yeah, third-party APIs kind of suck. Um, when they change, they do so without warning. They break large part of our system. The breakage happens across interface boundaries, which limits the usefulness of type systems. And we really need a way to ensure that the system continues to work. So what we've done, and this isn't rocket science, is we wrote an end-to-end -end test. Um, right? So there's a tool called Postman, which I'm sure many of you know which allows you to configure requests in a UI and fire them off against arbitrary endpoints and expect things to happen. 
Now, they also provide a command line tool which allows you to encode requests as JSON and then execute arbitrary JavaScript against that to enforce a contract. So this is actually a real test that we run against one of our endpoints. Um, it asserts that we feed in a bunch of stuff, right? So there's the request itself. You know, we feed in the latitude, the longitude, the excess. We've I've truncated it because it's a relatively lengthy request, but I think you get the picture, right? And we run this as a cron task in CI. It runs every hour on the hour. If our system is down due to API things, API things, that's a good name. We know, we will know very quickly and we will fix it. So that's how we address the uh, data constraints. There is of course the other side of things and that's that we work in insurance. Now insurance is a heavily, heavily regulated industry. There is an alphabet soup of laws and regulations that we need to be aware of and need to deal with. But the direct impact is that our data has to be consistent, right? If our data is inconsistent, that is straight up a lawsuit. That's waiting to happen. And the other one is that bugs, even seemingly innocuous ones, are expensive and can have regulatory impact. If we've sold somebody a policy and their email was incorrect because there was a connection issue, but our app told them that their email updated and they never received a policy, we have straight up sold them, we have taken their money, not given them a product, a regulated product. So we take data consistency very, very seriously in the cap triangle sense, in the acid transaction sense, uh, as a result of that. And that has a few interesting implications, right? So the first one is that obviously Mongo and its various friends are immediate non-starters for us. We need asset compliant relational databases. Now as it happens, our data maps quite cleanly to a relational model anyway, so that's nice. But that's the thing. The other thing is that we don't use RMs of any, so we don't use Bookshelf, we don't use Sales, we don't use Connects. We've written our own in-house, relatively thin wrapper, data mapper around Postgres that we use as fit for purpose. Uh, and the reason we've done this is that RMs hide inconsistencies in your data. So RMs will tell you that you have database constraints, but you don't. You have code level logic checks. Your data is in fact still in a state which could be inconsistent, which in our case is unacceptable. So the other um, output of this is that we actually take, we enforce our constraints at the database level. So in this case, it's, in this case we just have a foreign key. I don't, that's a bad line of code I copied there, but my bad. But yeah, we have check constraints. We even have triggers. We have triggers that run an update on um, insert to verify states of other tables. We've moved the actual logic, the actual data verification steps onto the database and wrapped it in an in-house data mapper. Now this obviously introduces a problem. The database now contains logic. Logic which is harder to test, or so we thought. Turns out there's a tool called PGTAP. And all it does is it lets you write unit tests against your database. It even lets you take, I don't have it here, but it lets you take code coverage metrics of your database. How much of the schema and the logic and the function are covered by tests. So in this case, we insert a bunch of things, we prepare a few statements, and we assert that one of them throws and one of them does not. We have more complex tests, but I think this gets the point across. So that's great. What about the expensive bugs, the expensive legally problematic bugs? Well, there's a few things we do. Obviously, we write unit tests. We write unit tests. They come out of all the things. We write them in Mocha, Mocha, Knock, and Synon on the back end. We use Jest on the front end. Nothing too crazy or fancy, honestly. Uh, we have uniformly set code coverage bars of 90% across the entirety of the code base. We review code review. We apply code review with exceptional rigor, and we use a tool called Danger, which allows us to enforce things like commit message lengths, uh, screenshots uploaded to pull requests, pull request message lengths, links to issue tracking systems, and other such wonderful things at code review. And we have integration tests with SuperTest and Postman. Now, we also have this uh, pull request template here that comes up whenever we open a pull request against any of our many, many repos. And this seems like a small thing. This in danger seems small, but no joke, overnight when we added this in danger, we just became better engineers. Just 
as a team, we just became better at our jobs. This has had more of an impact than unit tests. So the other thing, of course, is flow. We uh, take type safety very, very seriously because we kind of have to, right? We require annotations on everything. We require that every function argument and every function return value is annotated. We require that every array is read-only. Require that every object is closed and immutable. We generally try and avoid optionals. This is not a hard and fast rule because especially Redux state being what it is and React component life cycles being what they are, sometimes you really need optionals. But as a general rule, we avoid them. And obviously no any's, no objects, no functions, no crappy types, good types only, strict types. And like I said, mandatory annotations of all the things. Which actually does a lot. And we also try to make impossible states impossible. This is not my line. This is a line that's come out of the Elm community originally. I think it's become quite popular in the reason the Elm community as well. And all that it's really getting at, and this is something we've taken to heart, it's encoded in our code style, we talk about it in code reviews, is that we use flow types to ensure that crappy types like this don't happen. And the reason this type is crappy is that it allows lots of states which aren't possible, right? You, you may think that you've covered all the conditions, and in a sense you have, but you've also allowed states which should not exist. What does it mean if a field has never changed but is long enough? Or what if it's not long enough but valid? You've allowed an impossible state to exist in your application. So instead we do this, right? We have a disjoint union across the specific possible states of any given type. We've made impossible states impossible, right? So we, I mentioned the case study, right? So we set out to, on, this, on this path using JavaScript for a variety of reasons. One of them was honestly that I was most familiar with, well, of the languages I knew JavaScript seemed like the most sensible choice. Um, knew well, anyway. And there are, there are some very good things about JavaScript, right? It's got first class asynchronous handling with promises, callbacks, now observables. <laughs> It's got a very rich package ecosystem. It's undergone a fantastic transformation over the last, say, five years um, from a dinky, you know, var self equals this language to like an actual language. And it's an exciting, it's an exciting space to work in. And it's relatively high performant, right? Depending on what you're being relative to, I suppose, but most certainly more performant than most other interpreted programming languages. Having said that, what we found is that as we've gone further and further down this road of type checking everything and moving through the database and all these wonderful things that I've just talked about, the code we're writing looks less and less like JavaScript. And um, we, end up, we end up spending a truly phenomenal amount of time wrestling with the type system to make it work because JavaScript is fundamentally untyped and allows all sorts of weird states. Uh, there are odd bugs that we still don't catch. So, what is the result? Well, we've got a lot built, and we've had fun doing it, but we are currently considering ReasonML, specifically React Reason for the front end, for future technologies. Not to throw away the current stack, because that is a crazy expensive proposition. And we are currently in the process of building a Haskell server on the back end for some more infrastructure. So. The answer to the case study, I guess, is not that well. So this is us, the whole team. Look at these uh, handsome ladies and gentlemen. This is us, again, in an offsite, and we are hiring, mandatory hiring slide. Come join us. If anything I've just said is in any way interesting to you, resonates, come talk to me. I've got an app here, well, the app on my phone. I'm happy to show demos in general, but also come talk to me, I'm hiring. Questions? <laughs>